<clears throat> I know, Sylvester, what are you doing? It's April. I mean, it was April when I wrote that script that is on my second monitor right now because it's May now. Why are you uploading a Halloween video now? Well, it's very simple. This video is late because I was summoned. I had to go back to Transylvania to deal with some old family business and then I had to go into a slumber for a few months and that is the reason why this video is so late. I bid you welcome or a welcome back. I am your host for tonight, Sylvester Lazarus. One super quick disclaimer, since I filmed a few scenes for this video, I started wearing some makeup and uh, started wearing nail polish and uh, I've been also doing some voice feminization training. So the thing is that my voice and my face is going to be changing through this whole video and uh, you know, it's a messy and chaotic process and I won't always have the matching recordings and audio for the video since it's been going on for so long and when I say that it's been going on for so long, what I really mean is that I've been procrastinating on it for so long. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it's going to produce some of these uh, some of these situations, but what can you do but roll with it. Last time I talked about my 2023 Halloween project, I showcased these 15 pictures, the first 15 pieces of Mab's Draw Loving Club 2023 and in this video today I'm going to show you the rest. Since the first part of this video had a really long intro I decided to make this one really quick, so quick in fact. <laughs> Number 16. Black Lagoon. This was actually one of the first pieces I completed because I worked on some of the later entries here and there and this one was actually based on an OC request from Reddit from r slash draw for me. It was originally a really cartoony and cute design. I turned it into a semi-realistic piece with actual real-life proportions. This character has a really cool looking set of fins that pose for her hair. I found that part really interesting and nice to work on. The way it has uh, some amount of translucency and the is also casting a significant shadow made it extra fun. Then also the entire skin is colored with this rather desaturated purple where the saturation really comes out in the shadow areas. I imagine it's because of the almost gray skin with red blood underneath. By the way, if you haven't drawn any humanoid floating underwater, it's trickier than you think. I had to mess around a lot until I found the right pose. I'd say it's just a default of everyone that they try to balance people as if they were standing on the land, but as soon as they are floating, yeah, that whole logic falls apart and your brain starts protesting. I kept uh, the foliage and light rays minimal. I wanted to make a realistic shallow water with a lot of plants and sunlight for this one. Prompt 17. Ghoul. This one came out accidentally much better than I hoped. Upon trying to find something for this character, I just randomly came up with the idea of making him a funeral director, which is just as morbid as you would expect, and I guess you would expect that this is some shady business where not all the corpses arrive to the grounds, or at least not all parts of the corpses, and yes, that is called speciesism, don't do that. My idea was that a creature so deeply associated with cemeteries and who lived as an at least somewhat outcast creature who isn't repulsed by the idea so much would naturally go into the funeral business. Maybe feeding off the bank accounts of the living relatives rather than on the no longer living, but also being proud and to row with their profession. In a technical sense this was one of the species where I already felt in the sketch stage that this will be one of the more exceptional ones, the ones that are not so over complicated but also will look the best. I will say that that the combination of an interesting pose, readable design and good color choices really contributed to that and it was already showing early on. Number 18. Ominous Owl. 
I didn't fill up the series with uh, Harry Potter characters, but I also never made a piece of Hedwig or Owls in general, so it was time. This one, I struggled a lot when it comes to figuring out the pose and the rendering of the wings. First I made a landing pose with the wings pulled up, but it was really not working out as well as I thought, so I used that as a separate owl for the background and I remade Hedwig. Now, who is going to receive that howler in the red envelope? It can only be me for procrastinating on this for so long. Speaking of red envelope, I made the envi entire environment a mix between green to contrast the envelope and the shade of blue that comes from the sky. So this feels like an early morning with all the fog being lit from the greens of the forest and the, the blues of the sky until it all merges into this almost one color that still can contrast the envelope. It is also a good way to add some red reflected light to the feathers. Also I'm sure everyone who saw Chamber of Secrets will remember the red envelope and understand why this owl is so ominous in our little story. I'm really not that happy with how the anatomy of the owls turned out. It's a little bit wonky. I suppose most people wouldn't really notice unless they are really into owls and so many of them. Still, looking back at it, they feel a bit too much like cartoon owls than real ones. On the other hand, the composition with the two owls balancing out the red envelope turned out nice, making it an overall pleasant piece. Number 19. Classic Horror. Here comes something I haven't done before, implementing traditional drawings into the challenge. See, in April 2023 I started traditional drawing and I haven't shared most of my works because they are questionable at best, but I scanned a few that could belong in the classic horror trope. We have a piece mostly based on The Exorcist, a Dracula that was meant to be based on Bela Lugosi, but yeah, um, it went really off rail really quick, and a Karlov's Frankenstein I briefly showed in a previous video. They were made with graphite and charcoal on paper. After scanning, I did some edits to all of them, mostly contrast adjustments and some little fixes, but they are as close to the originals as I managed to keep them. Also, if you look at the wallpaper, that's actually a random drawing I made that was meant to be centered around the idea of mental degradation. <laughs> and I put some red nail polish on my fingertips and wiped them off on the paper as if a bloody hand touched it. By the way, all of the red on the first two pieces are the same red nail polish. I will talk about that in a video someday. Giving the pictures different frames was meant to make them as if they came from different places and time periods. Maybe the one that has Karloff is a bit too modern looking with just a simple pattern. I'm pretty sure my my grandma has some of these and they were mass produced cheap frames. Maybe we could say that it was repurposed at one point, somebody slapped an old drawing into a new frame. Overall more novelty based value than actual aesthetic and technical skills, I'm still fond of it. It's a prototype for using traditional drawings in my digital works and it was a good way to use these drawings. Number 20. Extraterrestrial. Totally by accident, but the two pieces that implement traditional drawings are next to each other here. This one was a repurposed random study from some time back. I've been practicing by combining monsters with human characters and I combined the Predator from the movie franchise and Rob Zombie, the musician and filmmaker. This was originally graphite on paper and because of that, out of all the pieces made for this challenge, this one took me the longest. So much so that at one point I did a 3 a.m. ritual before finishing the drawing. After scanning it I just wanted to mess around with the colors a bit and then it became the piece for the challenge eventually. Zombie's appearance was based on this one album cover made by Basil Gogos. I didn't know his works before but upon researching for this one I found that he made a lot of classic horror paintings of the Universal Horror Monsters. I really recommend checking those out. The name of the card became the Astro Creep, which is a reference to one of the White Zombie songs titled More Human Than Human. It felt like the most appropriate title for a piece like this. In case you haven't known, shameless plug, actually anti-shame plug, this guy is a vegan activist. 
So here's a giga-based quote, everybody loves animals until they hear the word vegan, then they will argue tooth and nail why it's acceptable to abuse them. So remember, if you abuse animals, the astro creep is out to get you. Number 21. Crow. I will be 100% honest, when I looked at this list first, I said, ha, huh, I'll just do something with Edgar Allan Poe and his crow and call it a day 21. Then I realized that Poe had a raven, not a crow, so I decided to turn him into a scarecrow and make him extra grumpy about it. No, this is literally how I came up with this, I'm not joking, I didn't just make up this whole, whole story for the video. I always confused the crow and the raven, I couldn't tell you anything about either of them really. I pulled up some pictures that show the difference between the two birds to make extra sure that this one looks like a crow. For Poe himself, I was in a Discord call with a few people and at one point I said, hey, strange question, does any of you know what was the eye color of Edgar Allan Poe because I'm fighting conflicting infos actually, but uh, nobody knew, so I gave him heterochromia. Yes, Poe is a Tumblr sexy man now and you can't do anything about it. It is already done, it is already finished, all you can really do is cope with this information or at least do your best to find any way that you might be able to cope with it. By the way, this might be one of those pieces that turned out the best in my eyes. The wet field ended up a little bit meh, but the face and the coloring is much better. It was also one of those fancy coats that can be easily ripped to pieces, so it looks more interesting. Also, for the title, I wrote down Raven, scratched it out and put the crow in there. Some really subtle visual humor. Number 22, Magic. Now, confession time. I took this one really loosely. I also totally didn't accidentally make this for the magic prompt instead of the mythological prompt, by the way, I originally wanted. I didn't switch up these two. Not that it matters, but you know, I just wanted to mention it. Now, I made a remake of one of my pieces from 2020. I originally made a random Mothman that looked passable, but had some really big issues when it comes to the third dimension. This time I might have overdone that third dimension if you think about certain features. I made the sister of Mothman this time, holding the presentation in a secret base in Antarctica, where all the cryptids are hiding and plotting their moves against the humans that managed to infest the entire planet in the last few thousand years, but especially in the last 500. This was really one, one of those pieces where I realized how much I actually improved. It's not an insane level of improvement, but just look at the two side by side. The new one has form that could be made into a joke. Actual 3D form. The wings are not just blobs, but they are actually complex shapes with texture and light. The face is a complex object that has both a rotation and a proper expression. The only thing I was and continue to be proud of is that cast shadow. That is perfection and always has been. <laughs> like I made the original piece back in 2020 and I just looked at that cast shadow just just that random little shadow and I was like, oh, that is so cool. That is the most amazing little detail that I ever made. Everybody just marvel at that cast shadow on that board. Yeah, I, I <laughs> thinking about like hyper focusing the little insignificant details because they somehow uh, make you feel <laughs> that you are better, uh, at least at a technical sense than you are, but you know. <laughs> The, the new one is definitely the better, better version. Number 23, Yokai. This one is a continuation slash expansion of the Yokai Day piece I made last year. I made a piece of this Japanese folklore actor named Shuten Doji, who was a prankster wearing an Oni mask to scare children for fun, and then the mask got stuck to his face. And because it's a Japanese tale, he was, of course, exiled, got into black magic, made an entire undead army until he needed to be slain by a hero who was sent by the emperor. 
which is a completely healthy reflection of the political climate of Japan of the time. I originally made a piece that featured his head on the table and for the rework I wanted to give him an actual body, but beyond that I also modified the mask so it has the features of western depictions of the devil with the moustache and the goatee along with the big horns. I also gave him human eyes to show a much more sympathetic side of the character because remember Shuten Doji's behavior didn't come from nowhere. Okay. There's a case to be made that he is the person unjustly cast out by society for his way of coping, both his addiction and immature pranks in his case, instead of being helped by the community to become a better person, only to later become what they feared the most and being turned into the sole villain of the story after many retellings, instead of acknowledging all the wrongdoings that led to his creation. I wonder where I saw that for the last time. Hashtag free Palestine by the way. Number 24. Nocturnal. Now after the politics, he's a fox bat raccoon. A cute combination of three creatures of the night. I have not much to say about it. See, I made many animal pictures on Fiverr some time ago, so the fluffy fox and raccoon parts came from some practice. The bat is just my favorite animal I painted many times. I feel like I say that in every video. Overall, it was a crossover waiting to happen. Also, someone who is pretty much nocturnal themselves, I can deeply relate to this creature. Back in the day when we had the lockdown, some foxes from the nearby woods were always cruising the streets at night, and even if you couldn't see them, they made those noises that will totally freak out anyone who doesn't know that these are made by foxes. Yes, I actually went with the most effort effective way possible for this piece by placing the wings in the middle that separate the transition, hide the hardest part of the body, and even part of the face of the fox. It looks a bit uh, more sneaky now, somewhat mimicking the iconic Dracula cape usage, maybe even makes the character feel a bit more sentient by intentionally covering the face. I feel like the overall light, especially on the wings, ended up really weak. It would have benefited from a more clean depiction of light, less glowing blue and more actual shadows. This is true to the rest of the body to an extent, and it overall drags down this piece quite a lot, but as a concept and by just looking at the individual elements it's not really a bad one. Just a nice cute fox bat raccoon. Listen to them, children of the night, what music they make. Number 25. Horned. Looking back at it, I'm fond of the way she's not a traditionally super feminine and kid-like character, especially with the big nose, big chin and rather high hairline. I wasn't planning to make them like that, but unintentionally it can serve a little purpose. She is the niece of Santa Claus and the daughter of Krampus, someone who is actually fond of Santa and despite her direct upbringing wants to have at least some of the values of of Santa. The main thing on the piece is her being in this rather hostile environment and having some distress despite her fitting into said environment. The color of the dress contrasting with everything was a compositional choice, but also given the fact that the Santa doll has the same red color, it could also show how she's comfortable with all that, just strives to have some qualities outside of uh, what she's being perceived as both in the appearance and because of her heritage. An extension of that being the horns, the most notable features of the character are decorated with various trinkets, including a heart and goofy pumpkin right next to a black bat and an upside down cross. She's also wearing a mistletoe as a necklace, which is a common love symbol alongside of being a symbol of Christmas and something Krampus might not be happy about, but these still function as comfort items that express her true inner self. Anyways, analyzing this piece a few months after it was made, along with the piece of that Child of the Grim Reaper and the genders 
swept moth. Yeah, I wonder if any of those uh, subconscious decisions I made with them are a reflection of me being a mostly closeted non-binary person at the time uh, when I made these. I will say they at least have something to do with it. But this video is not about me as a person, so moving on. Number 26. Tower. Wait, what? An existing tarot card in this series? Yes, I decided to include this one. I'm pretty sure most actual tarot decks have some sort of medieval or fantasy tower and Frankly, my series would fit one of those as well. I still wanted something more unique, and it's more of a sci-fi piece, featuring a radio tower in the Arctic, somewhat inspired by the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft. This one had a really long ugly face, which is obviously something linked to me not being experienced in buildings and just human-made structures in general, so I struggled with just how exactly I could make this, and I looked at a bunch of reference photos, and one of those had an almost frozen tower that had a bunch of uh, snow on it and it was partially formed into icicles too so it almost just entirely covered up all the metal pieces of the entire tower. I made a sunny and foggy snowfall scene out of it. The sun will be switched to a moon once I combine all the images and it will also be changed into a night scene and it is going to be an important part of the whole narrative that I'm not ready yet to talk about. If you paid attention so far, you might be able to guess where this is going and what purpose this random tower is going to serve. For now, just admire some of those sand tunes. Number 27. Mythological. I made a jackalope for this one. I made one back in 2021, but it was a smaller scale project than this. I really remitted myself with that, but this time we have a full jackalope front and center. I even turned one of the initial sketches into another jackalope, like I did with the owl before, and this time the little creatures are not in imminent danger either. If you look at the colors of the one in the front, I'm Pretty sure you would not guess it, but it was based on the rabbit named Toast, who is an easter egg in Minecraft, who was based on a real rabbit who went missing and the team placed the pattern of the rabbit into the game, so I used it for my piece. Now I named the card The Legend, referring to the, just the jackalope of course, but also Minecraft is a game full of mysteries and though Toast doesn't spawn naturally, you need to name a rabbit Toast to make them switch to these colors. It's a giant wilderness where a jackalope with this name could be hiding. Also, I will headcanon that Toast the rabbit went to live with the jackalopes. I wanted to keep the environments minimal for most of these pieces, so I went a bit too far with this one, but it was worth it in the end. The whole desert came out pretty good. Nice biome change after the last one. Number 28. Hunter's Moon Number 28, Hunter's Moon. One of the more simple pieces from this series, somewhat similar to the Hatman where I barely did anything other than adding a pumpkin face to the moon that is shining above a bunch of naked trees. I randomly figured that uh, one of the default Krita photo curl brushes was really good for adding the texture of the moon, where it's not super blurry but still doesn't have any fine detail. I felt that every time I was adding small brush strokes to the moon, it just stopped feeling so distant and the texture of this brush naturally blended into it instead so it was much better that way. This is definitely one of those where atmosphere did a really heavy lifting, just adding some clouds and the subtle side of the moon where it's uh, fading away into the color of the sky and the glow of the moon that lights up the fog in the foreground that also starts to obscure the moon itself a bit so you will just see some washed out parts because of that alone and the atmospheric perspective in the trees that could have been a bit better done but they still are present once you add these elements all together that 
that really shows the layers of complexity just in this really simple piece. You can really see it coming together and becoming believable and interesting. You always see super clean pictures uh, that feature the moon but the foggy and dark atmosphere and the not so full moon adds a different charm to it. I also checked what the state of the moon was on Halloween 2023 in order to replicate that stage of the cycle. Number 29. Wolfman. Continuing my tradition of giving a twist to old concepts, we have a 19th-ish century noble painting as a base. You know the ones where some really wealthy person commissioned a portrait of themselves with some hunting equipment and other fancy things. This time I made a wolfman, who is a sniper, who is hunting the werewolf hunters at the full moon. The same people who would be the werewolf hunter protagonists in a gothic fantasy story. I have so many mixed feelings about this one. The anatomy and clothing render are all over the place. The clothes don't look worn enough either, but the face and the sideburns work much better. I wanted to make a somewhat recognizable werewolf or maybe a half werewolf who is not fully transformed. Now that I think about it, this might be a werewolf who can't fully transform, but everyone respects him for being the greatest sharpshooter who is keeping an eye on the werewolf hunters. Overall, okay piece. I would definitely redo the body or at least adjust it properly if I wanted to show it uh, to more people out of context. Maybe one day I will rework the weakest ones from this series and this one is definitely going to be included in those reworks. Number 30. Spooky Scary Skeletons. Trivia question. Who might be literally the most exposed artist in the world right now? Damien Hirst maybe? Thomas Kincaid despite being dead for a decade? Classics like Picasso? No, it's Midjourn... I mean Christopher Zetterstrand, the person behind the paintings from Minecraft, possibly most famously behind this iconic flaming school painting. Check out the video by Solar Sense for the whole story. What I did was combining the Osaru head with a real school to recreate this piece, just make it cold and snowy with giant pixel snowflakes clipping through the school. I will say that the most uh, fun part of this was making the snowflakes, they are all unique. Also I have this horrible same face syndrome partially because of the influence of the Asaro head, I'm trying to combat that to this day. Despite that, I had a fairly hard time painting the version that you see right now. Same goes to the jawbone, I'm just weaker when it comes to really precise forms. Overall, not a bad tribute, people who know the original will most likely recognize it. Number 31. Rest in peace. I've been wanting to make some photo of this painting for a while. It is a personal piece dedicated to the kid I attended daycare with and never spoke to. Then she died of uh, leukemia. I don't remember her name nor the exact dates. My most educated guess would be 1999 to 2003 and she might have been called Julia, which is Juliet in English, but I'm not sure about either of those. All I remember is that I went to the cemetery after the, after the funeral with my parents and took one white flower to the grave. I put in forgotten for the name because I literally don't remember it and I covered up the dates with leaves. It's similar to a piece I made in 2020, only it was my own gravestone with the end dates covered. I kept this one relatively simple. The engraving on the stone has a tree with long roots and flowers around it, then the real plant and the flower uh, brings uh, in the real colors to the piece. I kept it relatively simple, the engraving on the stone has a tree with long roots and the flower around it, then the real plant and flower bring in the only real colors to the piece. I titled the card Grief which is the only one from the series that doesn't have the 
in front of it. I wanted this one to be more unique and just by making a reference to grief being a really universal and ever-present thing instead of having one the grief anywhere. I have a different idea for a different version of this piece. I will make it one day maybe uh, and then I will talk about the whole thing somewhat more but for today that is the one we have and that concludes my Halloween project of 2023 mostly. And there we have it. It's uh, it's even really hard to put this on just one screen. Would it work better if I did this? Uh, not really. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I can do a range optimal. It's going to mess it up. Now it completely messed up the order, but <laughs> you know, here are the, the pictures and the little uh, Nosferatu cat right next to me has been corrupted out from the from the video. <laughs> Anyways, I know that this video was really late and possibly really messy at many places, but if there was some some miraculous circumstance that made you watch through both of these videos, I just want to say that I really appreciate it and I cannot express it in words how much this means to me. I feel like I, I, I end all of my videos with that, but I truly mean it. Did I actually write uh, an outro in my script? Wait, I actually did. Yes, I did an. I wrote an outro for this video, and I forgot about this. Wait, I totally forgot that I wrote a conclusion for this video. I should record that instead, instead of rambling here. What? Okay, let's let's implement some parts of this outro script that I wrote into the thing that I just recorded here. Recently, I learned about the existence of a song titled "Every Day Is Halloween" from one of the videos of May Leeds, and uh, I think I can really relate to that now. <laughs> Making a Halloween video in May seems strangely appropriate now and you know i'm just giving you a micro dosage of halloween through the entire year and thanks to that you can get a true piece of the true happiest season right now in the middle of spring summoning the ghost of the halloween of last year with this video and with the next one if that ever gets finished maybe during the summer or something the conclusion of this project is coming in the next video and i really hope to see you on the day that comes out but for today all i have to say is thank you very much for watching have a nice day create something even if it involves creating a halloween video about half a year away from halloween but most importantly don't forget to have fun while doing that farewell okay i was scared for a little while because uh, i was using a new alcoholic marker this year and it couldn't make a mark on my tongue for the, for the 31. So I managed to find the old one that I used last year, which is thinner, so I would have been able to write uh, the numbers more easily, but uh, this is what it is. Uh, at least I was able to write it on my tongue. <laughs> Already fading away. I, I really wanted to keep that gag from last year. I, I just didn't want to like write it on my on the side of my nose and then turn my head around so it's revealed or, or, or something. So uh, yeah, that's it. And I'm going to... Um, I'm going to find some soap now. <laughs> Farewell. F me, I accidentally recorded this with the wrong picture. I should have been recording it like this. <clears throat> Take number three. <laughs>